Am I okay to go? Cool. Okay, uh, if we're all sitting comfortably, um, I guess I'll begin. So uh, welcome to Blender Conference 2017. Obviously, you've probably already heard that from people far more important than me. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about rigging for formlessness or uh, tickling homeless pusses. My girlfriend accidentally said yesterday. It's not rude. She just really likes cats. Um, I can see some of you looking really shocked. Probably more shocked that I have a girlfriend than that she said that. But um, I think I'm just procrastinating. I'm slightly nervous. But uh, let's, let's, shall we just jump in? Uh, so my name is Chris McFall. Um, I trade online as uh, unitedfilmdom.com. And basically, I'm a freelance filmmaker and animator. Um, what that means is typically, I make very, very boring films for very, very boring companies. Um, it's not strictly speaking true. I, I, I do love my clients. They're all fantastic. But this particular job, which I want to talk about today, um, was an interesting one for me. Uh, it was uh, actually rigging a jellyfish for uh, a popular uh, London attraction based on the South Bank, um, which was, it's, it's great because a lot of my friends are artists and they all have exhibitions. And because I'm a commercial artist, they get to look down their nose at me when they're at galleries because I don't get to do galleries. But I get to look down my nose at them when I go to the bank. So that's nice. Um, so uh, I guess the best thing I can do is show you what I'm going to be talking about today. This is the final piece uh, that I created for said attraction. Um, it's about 2,000 frames of meandering under aquatic life. And uh, basically, the, the prerequisite for this job was that it loops. And therein lies a great deal of issues, because when you're working with something like this, you want to do simulations. You, the first protocol is, let's simulate this, except there is only one very small section of that that is simulated. The rest of it's manually animated. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Daniel Martinez Lara, who's here, which is, is a great shock, because I, I, to be honest, I just, I'm assuming I'm just getting Gleb's overflow, because <laughs> come on, what are you doing here? Um, he talked, uh, Daniel talked about uh, something called easy rigging, uh, I think last year or the year before, and it was just, it was a really nice principle for me, the idea of actually not overblowing a rig, not creating something incredibly heavy. And that was really important with this project because the importance of something that complicated is that you've got to be really economical with the computer power you've got because uh, otherwise you're not going to get 25 frames a second playback and you're not going to be able to animate anything. It's just going to be a mess and you'll, you know, you'll render it out and then go, that's not what I wanted. So I should jump in because I've got a lot to cover. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, one last thing before I do get stuck into that. Uh, this job weirdly came to me through, uh, most of my jobs come to me through my website, but this actually came to me through the Blender network. Uh, so uh, I just want to give a big shout out to that because it, it's, it's incredible. We get this free software, which maybe we take for granted, I certainly do on a daily basis, which allows us to make a living. And then uh, they're good enough to have a network which then gives me clients who you know, pay me. And then, you know, I, I, should they, I should just get them to do the work for me, I think. I mean, it's, it's just laziness on my part. But it was a really, really great job. It came through uh, the network. Another job actually came through there as well for Samsung, which is a, a really big deal for me. As I said, most of my jobs aren't that glamorous. So um, this is uh, what it looks like in Blender. I'm just going to scrub through. And uh, yeah, so my first tip for you, uh, my first port, uh, port of call when doing a job like this is you need to be organized. So um, a rig this complicated, it's hard to work on in situ. You, you've got this thing swimming around your scene and you want to fix something and none of your axes are aligned. So, I mean, if you were going to fix a car, you wouldn't fix it while it's still moving. You take it to the garage, you put it up on bricks, and you have a look at what you need to do. So um, the way I sort of uh, managed to do this is I've got a master empty, which has all the primary animation on it for you know movement throughout the scene. On that empty, we have it's, this is all very basic stuff. It's probably not a revelation to anyone, but you know you're stuck with me now, so tough. Uh, so I've given it a custom property called parenting. Um, and it's got nothing to do with actual children. Um, although I'll talk about my daughter all day if you give me half a chance. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, this custom property on an empty. That empty swims around the scene. Every item within, uh, within this construction then has a child of constraint to it. The child of constraint has a very basic driver. I could show you the driver. It's probably not of interest. It's so basic. Uh, graph editor, drivers. And 
There it is. It's three letters, V-A-R, <laughs> and it's relating to uh, exact, just picking out the master empty and the custom property parenting. So essentially, all that does is every item in the scene has that, and then I dial that up, and suddenly we've got our animation in situ. I want to continue working on it, I want to continue uh, fixing the rig, and I want all my axes aligned, I want to be able to work with you know, orthographic cameras very easily. I can do that for every item in my scene with one control. So that's the first tip. Um, really important because organization is everything. Um, from there, I'm going to go straight into just creating the rig, the bones, the bare bones of it. It's very simple. Again, as I said, the easy rigging principle. Don't create stuff that you don't need because it's an economy of, you know, of CPU power and so on. So we've got our root bone here. And all we're going to do is apparently have a nervous fit and start selecting the wrong things. Editing. And I'm just going to extrude out a bone, and we'll call that bone, yikes. I'm way more nervous than I thought. This is really good fun. Uh, so we'll call it bell peak. From our bell peak, we'll extrude another bone and another bone. We'll call this one upper. And because I'm a creative genius, we'll call this one lower. And it's really hard to blend when you've got a shaky hand. Ooh, that's not right. Cool. Uh, we'll call this one Control. I'm going to move through this as quickly as possible. So obviously, it's really boring watching someone build a rig. Uh, I could go all Blue Peter and go, Ooh, here's one I made earlier. That's just for the UK uh, people. Um, so we've got these bones. We'll select the bone, select the root, Control P. Ooh. Oh, that's like trying to play the bass. Uh, lots of finger stretching. Keep offset. Same for the second control bone. Keep offset. In fact, we'll do that with the bell peak as well. Keep offset. And why not? Upper to bell peak. Keep offset. So now we've got this chain of bones. What does it do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that's OK. Uh, oop. Control G. Oh, oh G. That's it. <laughs> Forgetting my shortcuts. So now we've got to actually make these bones do stuff. So we'll add a bone constraint, a damped track. The damped track will point towards our first control bone. And the next one, honestly, the whole talk's not this dry. It's just, uh, I figure if I don't actually show you how the bones go together, you might feel cheated and ask for your money back, but you haven't paid for this, so you know, whatever. Am I making any sense? I don't know if I am. So we've got these, uh, this damp track working. And now, if we do this, we've got this nice little filly jobby. But the key part about uh, jellyfish is how it pushes and flows. So we want this very particular mo motion. And now if we drag the bell peak, you'll see that it actually starts to look like something. Um, now, it would be a pretty shoddy rig if that's where we ended. So I'm just going to extrude out another bone from the bell peak. There we go. And another one. And I'm just going to scale that out so it's easier to select. And these two bones I'm going to make bendy bones. It's riveting stuff, right? So we'll take our bendy bone. We'll give it another constraint. We'll make it a stretch, too. And come on, fella. You know you want to. Oh, it's because I'm in the wrong mode, and that's not even the bone constraints, is it? Well, it's like amateur hour over here. So uh, stretch to armature, and we'll have our control one bone. And then we'll do the same with this. Stretch to armature. And oh, I've done the wrong one on that one, haven't I? No, that was the right one. Oh, I actually didn't screw something up. Who knew? So uh, now we've got something looking a little bit more like this. Um, and we can uh, use this, these curvy bendy bones to actually deform uh, the geometry, which I'll show you in a short while. So uh, they maintain the nice uh, flow of the curve. And it's, it's really just, it's a, just a super simple bone structure. Now, 
uh, there was something I was going to say there. It's gone. It doesn't matter. It couldn't have been that important. So select all, and we'll just reset that. So uh, there are a few more elements to the finished rig where I've got uh, a, another bone just here, which will uh, animate rotation in the very tips of the jellyfish's um, uh, bell. Yeah, every part of the jellyfish's anatomy is rudely named. I do apologize. It's bells, gonads, and tendrils. I mean, you, you couldn't make it up. So, uh, so those are the bones. That's the basic bone system. And I'll show you how that actually applies to our geometry. So here's the uh, bells and gonads. I just love saying it, you know. Um, and that's a really just, as you can see, it was quite simple geometry, just nicely laid out and uh, split and UV'd and, and projected so that you can do all your texture painting later. Uh, we've got our rig here. This is a slightly more advanced version with, uh, you know, just tidied up to look nice. And then we've got this, uh, this peculiar piece of geometry here. All it is is a line of edges and vertices traced around the side of our geometry. Um, Again, it's economy of your, you know, economy of geometry this time is just because we really need the playback to be 25 frames a second so that we can animate it smoothly. Um, and what we can do with that is just give it its armature uh, modifier. I've already done the weight painting, so I don't have to bore you with that. I can see the palpable relief in your faces. Um, and what we'll do is I'll just show you how that that looks. As you can see, this line of geometry is now following our armature. Uh, which allows us to do all sorts of fun stuff. There's that rotation bone I was saying about. Select all, G, S, R, make sure it's all back to normal. Now, uh, that's all well and good, but I don't, you, you know, you're probably wondering how that helps us to deform this geometry. Well, screw it. Uh, quite literally, screw it. There's a screw modifier, and what we do is use it to spin the geometry all the way around. Now, because the screw modifier follows the armature, it actually allows us to do something like this. And, ooh, yes. <laughs> oh, mama. So essentially, we can now animate the entirety of the geometry with a single sort of uh, set, a single sort of branch of armature. Um, and then if we want to break the entire project, what have I done there? <laughs> This is the problem with touch screen. You don't. You flick the screen, and everything goes mad. Um, I've actually lost everything. That's. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, did I? How did I even? How did I even manage to turn that on? I told you it's amateur, didn't I? Uh, right. So. Uh, what we can do is select our uh, bell and go and add geometry. Uh, it's uh, never getting old. And I'm just going to turn on a mesh deform modifier. Now, I've already baked this. Normally, this takes a little time to bind. It'll take, you know, 10, 20 minutes if you've really got heavy geometry. This is typically quite quick. But what that does, it binds our geometry to this mesh deform geometry, which the, with the screw mo modifier on it, and it will deform uh, along with it. So now we can move this. And actually, I'm just going to hide that. I'm going to hide that. We don't need to see that. Um, and you can see that we're actually now quite happily deforming our jelly. Um, so let's, uh, let's give it some animation just so I can show you how quickly this can be done. I'm so used to working with a, a, a Cintiq and a Wacom and just sort of, uh, this is all, ooh, a mouse. How very 1990s. Um, so yeah, we can do something like that and then can pull it back. This is the shoddiest jellyfish animation I've ever seen. Go on, Chris, work the bell. Sorry, so sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, as we can see, uh, it's, it is now animating, and that was relatively painless to do. Um, now, the thing about jellyfish is that they undulate and they move, and they don't have a uniform deformation across the entire uh, surface. Um, we've got this very rudimentary control, and I don't really want to have to make controls all the way around so that I can add detail to this defama deformation. But because we used the child of modifier, and it's actually centered in our scene and aligned along specific axes, we can use the wave modifiers. The wave modifiers uh, are very particular modifiers. They want everything to be aligned in a certain way. You can't just go, ah, no, do it along that plane, do it along this plane. It has to be done in a certain fashion. So um, those wave modifiers, it's very subtle because you don't want to over 
over bake it, but uh, yeah, you can. I'll just I'll just crank it up a little bit so we can see. But these wave modifiers create an uneven sort of deformation along the. Am I even doing it right? That's not something you want to hear in a presentation. Uh, so yeah, you can clear keyframes. That's probably screwing it up. Yeah, you can see this will create some unevenness in the mesh. Um, something that you can actually do from here, once you've actually got an animation you're really pleased with, you can actually bake that out to an MDD cache and, uh, and save that animation and add further deformation should you need to. I found I actually didn't have to do that because I got what I needed in principle straight off the bat. Consult my notes. Um, so, oh, I missed a stage actually because, you know, apparently I'm a real pro. Um, there is a, before you start any project, you really should plan it. You should look at your reference. You should look at pictures of what you're trying to create and figure out how you want it to look. So obviously, I went into lots of imagery, uh, looking at lion's mane jellyfish, the particular genus of jellyfish which the uh, aquarium wanted. And uh, something which I did, which I found really useful in Blender, was uh, just a little GIF because you know I can't screw it up that way, right? Um, I took footage of a jellyfish and I took the grease pencil and I traced around the outline, just frame by frame going around it and just sort of seeing how it felt. There's a couple of reasons to do this. One, when you're playing back video footage in Blender, a couple of nasty things can happen. It, one, it might slow down your computer, it might slow down your playback and prevent you actually getting that really good frame rate so you can do nice smooth animation. Two, there's a bug of some description and it might be down to the video codec or corrupt frames where occasionally Blender just won't load and you have to append your entire scene into another file. That's a real pain in the ass. Um, with the grease pencil outline that you've created from your, your reference footage, you've got uh, something which will play back without any issues. Secondly, you can parent it to an empty and therefore you can move it around your scene and realign it with your geometry so you can just check your reference again. And thirdly, and this is the most important part, you familiarize yourself with what is an entirely alien motion and you're familiarizing yourself with that motion frame by frame and getting more of an understanding of, you know, uh, of the flick and the weight and how it moves. So that's something just really, really worth doing um, with any project you start with. Start with the grease pencil, start with the most basic way you can. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> let's continue. So uh, I've done the grease pencil, workbench, bones. Um, bendy bones, uh, just a quick tip with bendy bones is um, there is a time and a place to use them. Um, I like to use them in basically everything, but I, I recently completed a project uh, for uh, this medical brace and it was a really cool project really good fun and i wanted it sort of animating and this this sort of rigid piece of plastic bends in and forms around the leg uh let me just see if i've got that here for you um but i originally did it with bendy bones and bendy bones normally work beautifully with everything but with particularly dense geometry and a particularly dense blender user um you can actually see here that the geometry is, is, is getting these ridges where the bone segments uh, you know, are, are, are meeting one another. And you get this odd deformation and breaking up here. And what you can actually do, I don't, probably don't have time to do this to, today and show you um, in full, but if you replace, if you put with the bendy bones uh, a curve with hooks and attach those to the bones, then you can actually get a much smoother um, animation and, and so much smoother deformation. So as you can see here, um, it's really a lot better. There's none of that jagginess. So uh, that's just something to bear in mind when you are using bendy bones with dense geometry. Sometimes it might uh, upset your assets. So what was the next bit? I should always refer to the notes because otherwise I miss stuff and uh, wind up apologizing a lot. So we've done, the, uh, we've done some screwing. Uh, <laughs> we've done some bones. Tentacles. So this is uh, another interesting part about this. With the tendrils of a jellyfish, um, the first place you'd want to go, and the first place I went, is hair and cloth simulations, trying it out, working it. And I spent quite a long time working with simulations and trying to get realistic collisions. Um, now, the other problem with, uh, as I said, the stipulation in the brief was that this loops. It has to be a loop. And when you've got a simulation, you can, uh, you can actually create a loop by creating a shape key of your first frame and then merging it together. That's not going to work 
so well with hair. Um, so it's going to be a real nightmare. And then you've got, uh, again, you've got collisions, which are, you can get it to work in Blender, but when you've got 2,000 frames, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tendrils, and you, your realism is compromised by it going through other parts of geometry, it's just not practical. You could be wrangling that for the rest of your life. So the system I came up with was this. Uh, essentially, we've got a little, uh, ten I've called this a tentacle collar. This, again, has the parenting uh, child of modifier, which we can snap to our geometry at any, any time. Then we've got, uh, essentially, just some lines, again, of verts and edges. So if you were to render this, there's no faces. It won't render at this point. And I've just sort of like sculpted it out to, uh, to be vaguely sort of tenderly and hairy. Um, Hairy tendrils, yet another rude part of a jellyfish. So um, I'm sure you can all guess what I'm going to do. I'm just going to slap a curve modifier on it, and we've got this uh, Bezier curve here. And if I were to, uh, oh, let's just turn off that. Uh, if I were to move it, then you can see it deforms quite nicely this geometry. Uh, then in order to be able to animate that uh, in a reasonable fashion, we've got hooks. Uh, so we can move these hooks around and it will move with it. Um, oh, brain fart. Don't you just love it? Um, so obviously, it's not going to look particularly detailed or crazy. It's a, it's a rigid mesh, which is just sort of following a curve. It's not going to do a great deal. We need it to look alive. So uh, the solution to that, I found, was using a displace modifier. Now, a displace modifier, we add a texture to it. We give it global coordinates so, uh, so that it, it these this texture is fixed in space. And as we drag, um, I'm just going to bring up our parent. Shouldn't have deleted the camera from this scene, should I? Um, so as we drag our stuff through space, you can see, ooh, wrong one. <laughs> I keep making really weird noises, don't I? Uh, you can see that the, uh, the displacement modifier actually acts like turbulence, and it starts to bring this stuff to life. And through tweaking the settings just enough, these uh, branches of uh, vertices will sort of intersect each other and actually really react quite a lot like tendrils. We've also got some wave modifiers over here, which do some more subtle motion. Um, and uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, again, these are, this is not... Uh, I'm aware, as soon as I, I sort of proposed to do this talk, I realized this was probably a terrible idea because when it comes to rigging in a room, in a conference like this, I'm probably not even in the top 10 best riggers in this room. There's probably a lot smarter people out here, but these are very simple solutions to quite a complex problem. So that's why I wanted to share them with you today. So if you're just going, but that's really obvious, I do apologize, I do apologize. Um, so the, the next thing which I did just in tidying up these tendrils, because obviously they still won't render, um, is I've added a subsurf modifier, you know, the ubiquitous subsurface modifier. Gives it a bit more smoothing. And then uh, we add a screw modifier, like 0.4 of a degree. So it just brings out the geometry to, to give it some faces, add a solidify modifier, and suddenly we've got something quite renderable. We've got this geometry which will then render and, you know, and it works. But Again, the importance of this, the reason you start with those verts and edges and not faces, um, is because if you add the displacement onto that, you'll get, uh, in fact, I can show you, if I just move my displace modifier down a bit. Come on, little fella, there we go. Um, and I'll crank it up. Go away, toolbar, taskbar, whatever you're called. Um, if I crank this up, you'll see that it's, it's no longer deforming the path. It's deforming the, the actual geometry around it. And you get these sort of crinkly sort of edges, which are uh, less than ideal. It, it can be quite a good look, actually, but it's not what I was going for. The displacement modifier is merely altering the trajectory of a path and not the actual geometry around it. So it's all about stacking stuff in the correct order and getting what you need. So as you can see, uh, we've got that. And we've got this rig now where any time it sort of intersects with the bell, you can make a real-time correction so that it's no longer intersecting. And you've got a relatively um, 
a relatively controllable system. So basically then you need to repeat that about 12 times around the, uh, around the collar and you get a dense mane of tendrils which you can then manually animate painstakingly whilst crying into your coffee. So, oh, I've done it again. Uh, again, another tip with this is with these hooks, you can actually parent them to, uh, to a variety of bones in the thing, and that will allow you to sort of give them an overall sort of swim around. Um, now, what time is it? I've already run out of time, haven't I? That's fantastic. Uh, so, I would have liked to have shown you a little bit about the cloth sim. This is the only part which is using a simulation. It's fairly dense geometry attached to a parent, uh, to the parent empty. And as it's dragged around the scene and stopping and starting, it undulates and sort of catches up with itself and then stretches back out. <coughs> That's then baked to an MDD cache. And then what you'll find, the, the issue there uh, with the MDD cache is that the origin will start slipping away from the geometry. So what you do is you create an, you create an inverse parent on that MDD cached um, geometry. And the inverse parent is basically you're, you're timesing the motion on the z-axis by minus one, and it will create an inverse parent. Then you can MDD cache that back out, and then you can just parent that to the geometry. I'm out of time. I would have loved to have talked about... Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just want to say one last thing. There's a couple of other things I would like to have talked about, about uh, defamation with eyes, but there is actually a tutorial I did for CG Cookie, which is already out there. You can go on CG Cookie. Become a citizen. There's so much great stuff to learn, no matter what level you're at. This project wouldn't have been possible without the Blender network first connecting me to, uh, to the client, without Blender itself, and without Render Street, who helped me so much with actually getting, before noise reduction, getting this, uh, this final piece out. I'll just uh, play it one more time just for those who didn't enter the room, and the final piece. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a great conference, and uh, peace, y'all. I don't know why I did that. <laughs>